Madagascar. First light is celebrated in song, in a forest like no other on earth. This rainforest is the home of the Indri, the largest of all the lemurs, and man's distant primate cousin. The Indri is unique, like virtually everything else in Madagascar. Ninety percent of the animals and eighty percent of the plants are found nowhere else in the world. The name Lima means ghost, but these precious forests themselves are only fragments and shadows of what once was. Today, a huge international effort is underway to save the island of ghosts. Madagascar is no lost conservation cause. In the remaining forests, remarkable new plants and animals are still being discovered today. Already, the forests have yielded a powerful cancer treatment, and there are important medicinal treasures still to be recorded. but it will be a race against time because Madagascar is an earthly paradise being consumed from within. Just 2,000 years ago, the first human settlers arrived from Indonesia, Africa, and the Persian Gulf. Their cultures merged and produced a blend as unique as the wildlife. But they also brought with them alien slash and burn farming traditions. This is the burning season. More than a third of a country that's larger than France is set ablaze every year to create brief new pasture. As Madagascar's population has grown, so have the fires. A way of life that over the centuries swept countless species into extinction now threatens the people themselves. 85% of the forests have been turned to ash in the wind on an island now recognized as a unique evolutionary laboratory. Madagascar broke off from Africa nearly 200 million years ago. 200 years ago, a French explorer could write, Madagascar is the naturalist's promised land where you meet bizarre and marvelous forms at every step. At Morandav in the southwest, an ancient dry forest is the home of one of these bizarre and marvelous forms. In Africa, it would have been a hunting cat. And to this Shifaka Lima, it's just as threatening. But the fossa is a relative of the mongoose. In isolation, it has evolved into the island's biggest and most powerful predator. The shifaka warn each other of the danger. The fossa usually hunts at night when its prey is less alert. In daylight, the adult shifaka is too wary to be caught easily. But one of the babies, clinging to its mother's fur, might be panicked into letting go.
millions of years of hunting agile prey has endowed the fossa with its own superb agility. But it has its limitations. It cannot climb a tree trunk which it can't grasp with its two front paws. A large baobab might as well be a glass wall. In temperatures which can reach 42 degrees Celsius, a daylight hunt will not last long. So for the mongoose that would be a leopard, it's time to wait till the cool of night. At dusk, another member of the mongoose family hunts on the forest floor. The Boki Boki will find a substantial meal in a Malagasy giant cockroach, 10 centimeters long. Giants have evolved in Madagascar, only to be lost in a wave of extinctions. But many still remain. The Malagasy giant rat is the size of a rabbit and is one of ten rodent species unique to the island. But this one is found only in a small part of Morondav. The rats emerge at night to feed on fruit, seeds and bark. Each pair of rats has a large burrow system and they're sociable creatures, gaining entrance to each other's burrows by squeaking an identifying password. Dawn in the dry forest of Morondav and the start of another blazing Madagascar day. As the dry season begins, the few watering holes are drying out and there won't be rain at Morondav for more than nine months. Baobab trees can store water in their spongy, bottle-shaped trunks. But the surface water is evaporating and the birds have to make the best of a dwindling supply. Many of Madagascar's birds are descended from immigrants from Africa but, like this Malagasy sparrowhawk, they have evolved differently. The Malagasy harrier hawk is another example, and is much more colourful than its African cousin. The search for water brings predator and prey closer together. The lagoon is now nearly dry, and most of the water that remains is below the surface of the mud. The harrier is not just thirsty, he's hot. Beneath the surface, the mud is cool, and where a vein runs close to the skin, the harrier applies a cold compress to lower his body temperature. The heat is no problem to another of the island's endemic species. Half of all the chameleons in the world come from Madagascar. And this one, at 60 centimetres, is the biggest. Chameleons are harmless, but they're the most feared animals in Madagascar. To the local people, they're the manifestation of a human spirit not yet at rest. They're thought to have dark, magical powers. According to one old saying, the chameleon's independently swiveling eyes enable it to keep one eye on the past, one eye on the future. The future, however, is disappearing at a terrifying rate not by the chainsaws of international commerce, 
but by the axes of desperate people. Today, only 15% of Madagascar's ancient forest remains, and great holes are still being torn in the canopy. There's now a flood of foreign aid to try to slow the destruction. These forest guards are being trained by the Worldwide Fund for Nature as part of a 15-year plan to save Madagascar. If the conservationists cannot succeed in a place as special as this, there's little hope for the rest of the world. Here at Ankarana in northern Madagascar, the guards know the illegal tree cutters will be back. The trunk is nearly dry enough to be cut into planks. The guards have had some success in stopping the destruction, but as a result, they face growing hostility from local villagers. If we simply try to enforce the law, as has been done at the Ankarana, the guards lose the respect to the local people, and the local people get hostile. We had to go down to the Ankarana last week to hold a public meeting to explain to people the role of the guards, what their job was, and why they were there. Because the guards said there was an area they could not go into. The local people had been threatening to kill them. A lethal natural barrier defends part of this northern forest, the Ankarana Massif. Brittle spears of limestone stand guard round a secret world that few have ever seen. Worn by the action of thousands of years of tropical rains, the rocks are as sharp as knives. 120 meters high, they form a seemingly impenetrable fortress. Inside these walls lie pockets of sunken forest, dark even on the brightest day. Outside the Ankarana, rare crowned lemurs are hunted for food, even within officially protected areas. Massive deforestation and burning have wiped out their other habitats. A truly endangered species, these are some of the last crowned lemurs in Madagascar. Other wildlife flourishes within the fortress, like the Galidia elegans, the red mongoose of Madagascar. These mongooses are hunting for food across the floor of a climax forest, the result of millions of years of separate evolutions. Three distinct races have evolved in Madagascar, and thanks to their broad diet, they're still fairly common where they have forest undergrowth in which to hunt. They'll eat anything, insects, eggs and young birds, and even the occasional snake, although this one's a bit too big to tackle. Barely visible in the fold of a tree, a nocturnal lepi lemur waits out the hot daylight hours. The eyes of the lemurs appear to hold the sad wisdom of the ages, and it's not difficult to imagine why the Malagasy have so many myths about them. To them, the lemurs are their ancestors from the forests. As they sit motionless in the trees, these rare Sanford's lemurs seem to stare with curiosity, not fear, at human onlookers.
Virtually all the remaining Sanford's lemurs live in the Ankarana, most of them in a place called the Grand Canyon, a wide forest gully lying between the limestone pinnacles. Now these lemurs' natural defences have finally been breached. Since 1988, the canyon has been illegally felled by a powerful commercial logger, despite attempts to stop him. One day, we caught him cutting the trees without legal permission. We tried to confiscate the logs, but he gave money and gifts to someone in the Water and Forest Directorate to cover it up. Sometimes, we still find bulldozers, chainsaws and other materials in the protected forest. Secretly hiring village labour, Georges Kama and his business consortium have reaped rich and illegal rewards. Yet they blame others for the destruction of the forests. People accuse us of being the exploiters of the forest because we have the machinery and the permits. But the truth is, we're not. Doctors, vets, soldiers, anybody. They all cut the forest and they do it without any permits. Every time there is a problem, they blame us that it's really the black market. We wish we could tell the authorities that. Then there would be no problem and we could continue working. But the price of conservation is being paid not by the wealthy, like Karma, but by villagers and peasant farmers. These village elders are hearing about an agricultural aid project to be run by the World Wide Fund for Nature. The aim is to persuade them not to cut the forest and safeguard their own long-term futures. The villagers are sympathetic to the appeal, but many have little choice. Political interference has forced them to take desperate measures. A nearby protected forest. From the outside, it appears to be intact. But from the inside, all that remains is the forest canopy. The undergrowth has been cut down to make way for a banana plantation. The farmers here have had to move illegally into the forest because a private company with government connections called Procops took away their only means of survival, their fields. People have been sent to prison because they broke the law by cutting down the trees, but they don't know where to go. They no longer have their fields in the valleys here. They are desperate. They just don't know where to go. They can't go into the valleys because they're now occupied, and they can't go into the forest because it's forbidden to cut down the trees. The sheer pace of destruction in Madagascar is awe-inspiring. Slash and burn farmers continue to cut away the forests that anchor the hillsides, and here the early signs of catastrophic erosion are already appearing. Even among officials who try to stop it, there's a sense of helplessness. I was frightened by what I saw in terms of slash and burn of the slopes. So I went to see the local authority, and I said, how do you allow this slash and burn to take place? And he said, the Monsieur, je m'excuse. This morning, just this morning, I have here a farmer, paysan, who told me he has 12 children, and he has a very small plot of land, which doesn't give him enough food to sustain his family and he asked me for a permit. Now, what can I do, he said. Shall I condemn that family to death? But as more of the hillsides are cleared, the terrifying logic of ecological destruction takes over. In 
In the highlands of Madagascar, this is a common sight. As far as the eye can see, a devastated landscape where the hills have collapsed. Without trees, there's nothing to stop the ruinous mudslides. A rich but thin layer of topsoil was washed away from these hills long ago, and the streams are now clogged with the underlying red clay. Eventually, the hillsides will settle into a stable, sterile moonscape. As the clay seeps into the rivers, a torrent of red water crashes down towards the ocean. Madagascar's largest river, the Betsy Boca, is like a fatally opened artery. The fishermen of the Betsy Boca Delta have become accustomed to working in these shallow and permanently reddened waters. Nearby, fishing trawlers marooned on the silt are like bizarre relics of a past age. It's as if time is going backwards. High technology vessels displaced by the small age old outriggers of the local fishermen. In Madagascar, all the evidence of disaster seems to be accepted with little alarm. It's not complacency, more a belief in the power of fate. And above all, a belief in the power of ancestors. This is a Famadian, a festival of the dead. For these villagers in the highlands of Madagascar, the spirits of the ancestors are still part of the living community. They believe that all problems, including natural disasters, can be solved by drawing on the power of the spirit world. Exhuming the bodies from the village tomb is a way of pacifying the dead in the belief that they, in turn, will protect the living. The bodies are shrouded in white ceremonial cloth amid a carnival atmosphere. In a culture where human spirits never die, the recognition of a dying natural world has been slow in coming. The remaining fragments of forest are full of spirits in the shape of some of the surviving lemurs. A few are sacred, protected because of their spiritual power. But other species, like cockerel shifaka, are prey to human hunters as well as the loss of their habitat. Madagascar is a world of mythic beasts and living spirits, but necessity has made the people cut their natural world almost to the heart. Now, though, there may be a choice. Music in the cool of dawn plays through the strangest forest on earth, a forest that is completely without shade against a fierce desert sun. Here, the trees are clad with tiny leaves and large cactus-like thorns. In southern Madagascar, these dideria trees have adapted over millions of years to a climate with little or no rain. 
Their thorns once protected them against thirsty prehistoric animals. But they seem to pose no threat to the Veros shifaka that now occupy the trees. Many of the plants here are also poisonous, but the shifaka have evolved to thrive in this apparently hostile environment. The shifaka are the acrobats of the thorns, leaping between the trees without apparent injury. They don't have specially hardened hands or feet. Their jumps are just so finely judged that they take the thorns literally in their stride. These animals are remarkable in another way, for like the trees they inhabit, they seem to survive with virtually no water. But in a forest still armored against animals now long extinct, the trees have no defense against people. These are Antandroi villagers. Their name means people of the thorns. For centuries, they have lived among these strange trees, but now they're destroying them for charcoal. Charcoal burners are cutting through this forest so fast that it could soon disappear completely. Shallow pits are dug to burn one of the most ancient woodlands in the world. Throughout Madagascar, there's a desperate need for fuel wood. Alternative plantations have been grown but nowhere near enough. When the need for charcoal was confined to the local villages, the native forest had time to regenerate. But as the island's population has grown, so too has the demand for charcoal, and it's now packed and transported to towns many miles away. The villagers here still believe that the forests will always keep them from starvation. No, no, the forest will never come to an end. Yet the government want us to move from this forest because they say that nobody has ever made charcoal here before. But without the charcoal, there is nothing else we can do to make our living. Our lives will be impossible and our wives and children will starve. A Malagasy proverb says that the forests, like true love, are without end. But the evidence tells a different story. Deeper into the forest, other Antandroi keep traditions alive that act as powerful defenses of the place and its animals. In the village of Hasafuts, the people of the Thorns follow a way of life strongly ruled by Fadi, or taboo. They keep cattle, but they eat meat only on important ritual occasions, like funerals. The Antandroi express horror at the thought of eating any wild animal, because human spirits are closely identified with the life of the forest. According to the old Antandroi beliefs, to disturb their natural world is to invite catastrophe. Their food consists largely of vegetables, sweet potatoes, manioc and maize. Because they uphold their traditions, these people naturally protect their extraordinary world of thorns. As a result, the forest around Hasafuts remains largely intact. But even in the deforested areas, Madagascar is still capable of remarkable surprises. Darena in northern Madagascar. 
In the remaining undergrowth, the first sighting of a newly identified animal. Until recently, no one recognized that this lemur was a separate species. This was the first time it was filmed. The golden crown shifaka may have been discovered just in time for it to be saved from extinction. These ragged lines of trees are vital pathways connecting six larger patches of woodlands inhabited by the shifaka. But the pathways of trees are being cut down for fuel wood by local villagers. None of the six groups of shifaka is big enough to survive into the future on its own. They have to interbreed, and to do that, they must be able to travel between their woodland habitats. Without the pathways of trees, the constant presence of birds of prey will trap the shifaka in their isolated forest remnants. The Malagasy buzzard is unlikely to seize an adult lemur, but the shifaka are afraid of all hunters in the sky, and they won't run the gauntlet without the cover of trees. These woods were due to be cut down for charcoal. Now they're likely to be protected by law. With less than a thousand animals left, it's a strategy that has to work. Now that the world recognizes the plight of Madagascar's unique animals, extinction is not inevitable. A small group, led by Don Reed, is working to save yet another species that has been hunted close to the edge of extinction, the plowshare tortoise. His breeding program received Malagasy and international support at a time when only 30 animals remained. Plowshare tortoises get their name from the prong that juts out from the bottom of their shell. The prong is a weapon used by the tortoise during the mating season to drive off his rivals for the female. If ordinary pushing, bullying and barging don't work, the prong can be used to turn the opponent onto his back. This time, though, the loser knows there's no contest, and he turns away to avoid being tipped over. As his rival concedes defeat, the victor turns his attention to the female. Now it's her turn to be butted, and the prong has a different effect. While the plowshare's violence drives away competing males, it seems to arouse the female. The male uses his tail, which has a groove along it, to inseminate the female, and that's the end of his parental duties. The female will bury the developing eggs. The surface of the nest will be baked hard by the sun. This keeps the eggs safe from predators, but it brings other problems. Sometimes the rains come very late here, as they have this year. We're still waiting for it to rain. It should have rained about a fortnight ago, and we've had virtually nothing. So we've had to water the nests, because when the temperatures get above 40 degrees, those sort of temperatures for any length of time can be critical for tortoises. It could kill the babies. But we found in our first or multiple nesting season that the babies may hatch out of the eggs, but can't leave the ground because the ground is too hard for them to dig their way up. Opening the nests helped to save all the babies. In fact, we saved all our babies last year that could be saved. After just four years' work, Don Reed has doubled the world population of plowshare tortoises. If they can be released safely into the wild, 
it will have been one successful skirmish in a long war. In Madagascar's capital, Antananarivo, the busy market is the starting point for a battle against another kind of extinction. Nat Kwansa, a young Ghanaian botanist, is looking for clues to some of the forest's most closely guarded secrets. Among the herb stalls is an ancient folk knowledge about the forests as a source of medicine. No one will ever know where these cures came from, but with the exorbitant prices of Western drugs, many Malagasy depend on the old remedies. But in modern Madagascar, the collective memory of these medicinal cures is starting to fade, and it could soon be lost forever. Only in the remotest places is it still strong. Most of this information on the uses of the plants are passed on from generation to generation. And in the course of doing this work, we came across an elderly person and he didn't know anything about medicinal plants, which to me was a bit strange. So I said, how come? He said, my father died before he could teach me. So there is that chance. If we don't document the information, we might lose it. To record this information before it's lost, Nat Kwanza and his students have to reach an isolated mountain in the north of the island. Perched on the mountain top, among a unique forest, is a tiny village. This is the family home of Indronola, an ombiash, or medicine man. Hashi. Hashi. With the knowledge handed down through generations, Ndronola knows much more about this forest than any trained botanist. Under the canopy, he leads Nat Kwansa through a forest pharmacy that is one of Madagascar's greatest untapped natural resources. Almost all of Andronola's cures are unknown to Western science. But all the Ombiash are being forced to retreat further into the hills to harvest their medicines. There's not much further for them to go. An old Malagasy story tells of a great fire that swept through the island's central forests a thousand years ago. Today, the fire still rages. After just a few years of burning, the land becomes sterile and the forests can never return. The fires are lit to provide food for cattle, which feed on the green shoots that spring up to replace the burned grass. The result is a wasted and eroded land, where the people grow poorer. Madagascar's population is growing at one of the fastest rates in the world. Half the people are under the age of 14, and family income is $200 a year and falling. In an island culture ruled by ancestors, the environmental destruction will only be slowed down if some of the ways of the past are abandoned. It will be a painful transition.
The true rhythms of the island are found here in the rice fields. Age-old cycles of preparing, planting and harvesting the rice continue to govern most villagers' daily lives. But Madagascar is being forced by poverty and environmental destruction to look for an alternative destiny. One hope for the future lies in the island's vast, untapped mineral wealth, but its exploitation will affect the lives of many Malagasy, some more drastically than others. These are the fishing grounds of the Antanush, or people of the island. The lakes are not only a source of food for the Antanush, they contain sites that are sacred. To the people here, everything under the surface is the realm of ancestors. But the waterways and the nearby forest have a new leaseholder, QIT, a subsidiary of the giant mining company Rio Tinto Zinc. This corner of southeast Madagascar is rich in ilmenite, the mineral sand used in the production of titanium. Serge Lachapelle, the mine's director in Madagascar, admits the project will change the lives of the Antanouche. Well, they're surely going to be affected because this project will probably create uh, about 600, five to 600 direct jobs. And this area doesn't have much industry except a very small industry. And most of the people do not work in industrial environments. So there is no doubt that the project will have a big impact on the population itself. And the initial impact will be felt here. Across the entrance to this cove, a sandbar separates the Indian Ocean from the Antanush Lakes. This will be the site of an industrial harbor. The sandbar will be removed and the Indian Ocean will flow directly into the freshwater inlet. Yards away from the proposed harbor entrance stands the village of Ivatre. What will happen to its inhabitants isn't yet clear, but it's unlikely they could stay. Villagers say they're afraid of the mining company and an incident at a nearby sacred site has increased suspicion. We found some people at these tombs and we asked them, what are you doing here? They said they were from the mining company and they wanted 50 or 60 meters of land, including where our tombs were. They asked us what we wanted in return, but we told them they were treading on our tombs, and so they would have to make a sacrifice and kill a cow. We didn't want them to come here, but we are afraid because they were white. The mine will also cut through this rare but damaged sand dune forest. QIT claim that they will do more than restore it. We could replant it as it is, but I believe that people will want us to put trees on. The shape of the forest will probably change a little bit. But after five to ten years, uh, from here it will look basically the way it looks now. The forest's wildlife like this boa constrictor, will also be in the way of the mine. An important environmental report on the forest has turned up three reptiles and 48 plant species that are new to science. This chameleon is found throughout Madagascar and would have no trouble adapting to other surroundings with an adequate supply of food.
but the pitcher plant is only found in the southeast of the island. Heady, alcoholic fumes lure prey to perch on the slippery lid of the carnivorous flower. Small frogs and insects provide the plant with the nutrients it cannot get from the sandy soil. Death is by digestion. A final decision on whether the mine will cut through this forest hasn't yet been made. A key investor, the World Bank, says its support is conditional on estimates of the environmental damage. There's no doubt the bank is sensitive to international criticism. We know that the project is economically feasible. We still don't know what are going to be the environmental costs. Now, suppose the Malagasy government uh, would decide that despite the cost, it would wish to go ahead with a project. The international community may attach a higher cost than the Malagasy government or the Malagasy people to the environmental impact. What will be the situation then? Will the international community be prepared to compensate the, the Malagasy government for the loss of revenue? But it's not just hard cash that will keep Madagascar's unique heritage alive. A vibrant but fragile culture can protect the forests, even though the people themselves have few resources of their own. But money is needed to stop the people burning it down to survive. Saving Madagascar is perhaps the world's greatest test for the conservationists. It will take money and imagination to fight two battles against extinction and poverty. The price may be high, but the benefits could nowhere be higher than in the land of the Lima the island of ghosts. Ziri ni vuzi na fa. 